Now the latest ITV news from Granada Reports with Gamal Fambale and Lucy Meacock. Hello and uh, welcome to Granada Reports, live with the latest across the Northwest. Hello, on the programme this evening. Pay up, Rishi, Rishi, pay up. The message to the government is clear. Teachers join thousands of other striking workers on picket lines across our region. We've had a 20% cut in our wages, which is the equivalent of working for one day for free out of five days a week. We asked the Teaching Union's Northwest Secretary if they're ready to dig in for a long fight. Also on the programme tonight. Five years on, the government says it will respond to the former Bishop of Liverpool's report on the Hillsborough disaster this spring. From M people to young people, we talked to Heather Small about the show which celebrates the voices of children. And don't miss Finley. He's the rising star in the speedy sport of squash. And we're on Comet Watch this evening here at Judgeville Bank Observatory, where the skies are rather cloudy, but will they clear in time for us to catch a glimpse? Well, first tonight, and it's being called Walkout Wednesday, the day thousands of teachers went on strike right across our region, joining workers in other sectors in the biggest walkout in a decade. Hundreds of schools in our region have had to close partially or completely. Some parents only found out this morning that their children couldn't go in. Teachers are striking alongside, among others, train drivers from the Aslev Union, some university lecturers and civil servants. Tonight we're joined live by the Northwest Secretary of the NEU Teaching Union. We'll be asking him about the impact on pupils whose education has, of course, already been hit by COVID lockdowns. But first, our correspondent Anne O'Connor reports on a day of dispute and disruption. They want to teach the government a lesson. Defend the right to strike! At a rally in Liverpool, teachers from the NEU marched with striking train drivers, university lecturers, museum staff. Support came from firefighters who've just voted to join industrial action and ambulance crews who've already been on walkouts. Amy, where are you a teacher? Uh, Liverpool Primary School. OK, and why are you here in a rally rather than in your classroom? Um, we care so much and we put so much effort in. We work silly, silly hours and this is just a little bit of a fight to get our better pay and save our schools. We've got members that are using food banks, we've got members that are on universal credit. Um, we've also got people that work from home but they're struggling to put uh, food on the table and heat their own homes. They're going making a cup of tea and they're seeing their own breath so it's just not good enough. The actions closed scores of schools like Gattaca in Liverpool. Teachers seeking an above inflation pay award they've been offered between 5 and 9%. It's not a pay rise here, it's a pay correction. We've had a massive pay cut over the last 12 years and it's about getting that pay back to make teaching an attractive occupation for people to come into again so that we haven't got a recruitment crisis, so we've got sufficient teachers to teach the children in our schools. Jill, Jill, pay the bill! Jill, Jill, pay the bill! The Jill they're calling on is the Merseyside-born Education Secretary Gillian Keegan. She's had talks but says bigger offers are impossible. Taking their demands seriously, but not to, but we've said we can't contemplate inflation or inflation busting pay rises because that would have a big impact on inflation for everybody else. We need to get rid of inflation, we need to get down, we need to halve inflation, we need to make sure that for the whole of the country, the pound in our pocket is worth more by the end of the year. Ten year old Charlie and his sister Daisy, who's 13, had to go to work with their mum, Nicola, a charity worker in Chorley. You put your holidays to inset days and you've got very little room for manoeuvre and at such short notice it's been quite difficult to arrange things properly. It's a conflict really where you can understand why teachers are off but as parents we're responding to these things and it's, it's already really difficult um, working through that working week with children as well. 
As more strikes beckon, the mood at the Liverpool rally was defiant and determined. There's a complete attack on working class people by the Conservative government. And we're seeing the trade union movement finally find its feet again after a long time in the doldrums of the ability to come out and fight for better pay and better conditions of service. They want to see the winds of change, but so far, ministers won't be moved. Anne O'Connor, ITV News, Liverpool. Well, let's cross live now to Litherland High School in Liverpool, where we join Peter Middleman, who is the Northwest Secretary of the biggest teaching union, the NEU. Uh, thanks for joining us tonight. So how much of an impact has the strike had there? Uh, well, we think that 85% of schools across the region have been affected in one way or another. The school that I'm standing outside of here today was open to year 11 students only and a handful of vulnerable pupils that was staffed by uh, teachers who aren't members of the NEU. Uh, that will be in the case in, in most places across the region if the schools were enclosed completely. So the government has offered teachers a 5% pay rise. We've heard in Anne's report about the risk to inflation. Why isn't that enough? Well, 5% in most normal years might sound like a reasonable settlement, but when inflation was running at 12.3% as it was last September, that represents a 7.3% pay cut, and that's the single biggest pay cut in 10 years of consecutive pay cuts for teachers, which means that their pay has lost its value by about 23% since 2010. Uh, it's also contributing to that recruitment and rec retention crisis in the profession, which is creating the largest class sizes for a generation. More than a million young children in class sizes now are 32 or more. And between a, th a sixth and an eighth of secondary school lessons being taught by teachers without a specialist qualification in the subject that they're teaching. So it's not only about the legitimate demand for a cost of living pay increase for a profession that's facing multiple crises, but it's also about uh, improving teaching as a career prospect so that that recruitment and retention re problem can be resolved. I hear what you're saying, but obviously if everyone is demanding pay rises, isn't that going to contribute to greater inflation? Well, inflation was 12.3% last September before anybody has had a pay rise, so it's not teachers' pay or public sector pay that's in contributing to inflation, and nor does that argument explain 12 years of consecutive real terms pay cuts. Teachers kept schools open throughout the pandemic for hundreds of thousands of children and moved to online learning for those children that couldn't move uh, into school. And their reward for that is the biggest single pay cut in 12 years, which means that over a career now where a teacher might be moving to the top of the pay scale, the rate for the job as we call it, if that was happening this year after eight years of teaching, we think that cumulatively they've been lost £64,500, enough for a deposit on a house, enough to pay a balance on a mortgage at the, the other end of the, of the age spectrum. It's not good enough and it is re uh, contributing to that recruitment and retention crisis. Are you prepared for a long fight over this? Well, members have given us that mandate. Today was the first of four days of industrial action that are being announced between now and the middle of March. But the next strike date is not until the 28th of February, and that gives the government four weeks to get their act together and come back to us with a meaningful offer. Just to accept that there is a real problem would be a start, and that's what the Education Minister now has to do. Peter Middleman, there we have to leave it. Thanks for joining us tonight. Well, many of you have got in touch about the teacher strike. Um, this one from Mike Holden. He says, a child missing school for a day is an inconvenience, but a government allowing teachers pay to drop in real terms year on year shows they care nothing for the future of state schools. Teachers are striking uh, for the long-term benefits. Well, Jeb Marsden says it is the last resort when all else has failed. When else does a government listen, but when people withdraw their labour? Uh, this one from Lee Boy. Uh, not much sympathy, if I'm brutally honest. I worked for over 40 years and was never able to strike. If I was not happy with my pay conditions, workplace, I left to find other employment. An average salary of £40,000 a year ain't bad, really. Many thanks indeed for those comments. Yeah, thanks for all those and please keep them coming. Well, next night, the government has now confirmed that it will officially respond to the former Bishop of Liverpool's report into the Hillsborough disaster this spring. Yes, the development was announced in Parliament earlier by the new policing minister. He admitted the government's response was overdue. One Merseyside MP says every day the families have to wait for the government to respond 
adds to the torture they feel. More now from our political correspondent, Leisha McNally. It was the disaster that defined his life and now dominates his political career. Ian Byrne was just 16 when he witnessed the tragedy at Hillsborough, when 97 people were unlawfully killed. Oh, it shatters yeah, your faith in the system. When you think the people, the agencies that are supposed to come to you, you help and rebuild your life and make sure that you get justice, all basically come together to deny you uh, that justice. Well, it shapes your very being and it certainly shaped uh, me. Today, the MP for Liverpool West Derby asked an urgent question in Parliament, calling on the Home Office to explain why, 34 years on from the disaster, five years after a landmark report into the victim's experience, and a day after the police replied to that report, there's still no formal response from the government. Questions echoed by other North West MPs. As soon as the police made the apology, there should have been a government statement. I've heard nothing from the Minister at the dispatch box today to say why there has been five long years. It took a long, long time, and this is adding to that torture of the families and those people who are affected by Hillsborough. The government says it's had to hold off because of legal proceedings, but has committed to replying in full this spring, prompting cross-party calls for speed and clarity, including from a former Prime Minister. Saying vaguely that the government's response will be available this spring, I do not think is good enough. At the heart of this debate are calls for what's become known as the Hillsborough Law, which would bring in a legal duty of candour, so officials who make mistakes and cause public disasters are forced to tell the truth about them. No cover-ups, only compliance with any investigation or inquiry. MPs also want to introduce a public advocate, funded legal help which will put victims on the same financial footing as the state they're trying to challenge. They say it will rebalance the scale of scandals which leave ordinary people fighting for justice. And it is not, as people have said, something that is just about football or Hillsborough. It affects people who have suffered because of Grenfell, contaminated blood and a whole host of issues where the state has tried to protect itself instead of putting the interests of the citizen first. The government says that progress is being made. I have already introduced this duty of cooperation in relation to inquiries, which is one of the most important elements um, of that. And the uh, response on the independent public advocate, um, which is also important, um, will happen as quickly as possible. The MOJ are working on it actively right now. Hillsborough promises have been made before, even making it onto party manifestos, but Ian Byrne feels the moment may have finally come. I just felt as though there was a bit of a sea change today. I felt as though there was a, there was a will in Parliament to make it happen. I think we'll get there. I really do. If they do, it will be the end of a decades-long journey, with implications for public justice that travel well beyond Merseyside. Leisha McNally, ITV News. Now, the parents of her mother of two, Nicola Bully, who disappeared last Friday from a riverbank in Lancashire, have spoken of their dread at never seeing her again. Nicola was last seen walking her dog alongside the River Wye in St Michael's on Wye. Police have made extensive searches in the area, but there's still no trace of her. Elaine Wilcox is in our newsroom with the latest. And Elaine, uh, what have Nicola's parents had to say? Well, Nicola Bully's parents have described their granddaughters sobbing their hearts out when their father told them that their mother was lost. Her daughters are just six and nine and their mum had dropped them off at their primary school last Friday in the rural village of St Michael's on Wire and she hasn't been seen since. Her partner, Paul Ansell, says their girls are desperate to have their money back home. Now, the mortgage advisor had been walking her dog along the River Wire. She'd been on a conference work call and a mobile phone was found on a bench still connected to that call. A member of the public found her dog Willow off his lead near the bench and raised the alarm. Now there have been extensive searches in the river and surrounding area and her parents Ernest and Dot Bully say police don't believe their daughter fell into the river leaving them to fear she may have been taken. They last saw Nicola the night before she went missing and said she was happy and really enjoying her job. Now, now, Lancashire Police have said this remains a missing person inquiry and there is nothing to suggest at the moment someone else was involved in Nicola's disappearance. OK, Elaine, thanks for the updates. The Prime Minister is going to meet the three dads walking. They include Mike Palmer from Greater Manchester 
And of course, as we've reported many times, they've been campaigning tirelessly for better awareness of suicide prevention. Their petition to get it onto the school curriculum has now reached more than 155,000 signatures. Of course, I pay tribute to Andy, Tim and Mike, especially for channeling their own personal tragedies into such positive action to prevent this happening to other families. That is inspiring and they deserve enormous credit. Uh, the government is taking action to improve the provision of mental health services for young people in schools and colleges, uh, but I would be delighted to meet with him and Andy, Mike and Tim to discuss what more we can do. Well, next tonight, and it's called Young Voices, and it's possibly, I would say, probably the world's biggest choir. Now, over the last 25 years, the show's brought together two million school children from across the country to perform at local venues near them. Yeah, it's a truly magical sight. They also sound beautiful, too. There'll be thousands of children from all parts of our region at the AO Arena in Manchester. And singing along with them is Manchester's very own Heather Small. Our entertainment correspondent, Caroline Whitmore, wants to cast an eye over rehearsals. Your dad founded Young Voices and now 27 years later you're still going strong today. Me, my brother and my dad were there 27 years ago in Dublin when we did our first show. 3,000 children it just grew and grew and now 2.5 million children have taken part. Heather Small, goodness me, we're here at AO Arena in Manchester. Magical Manchester, magical <laughs> Manchester, that's what I call it. It's 8,000 children from across the North West yeah. singing your song yeah. proud and I'm nearly in tears. <laughs> it's absolutely <laughs> magical, Caroline. It is the most fun. The children come in and they're so excited, they're so happy. And when they leave, they leave about 10 foot tall and that's what it's about. They feel that they can conquer the world and that's why I'm here because I, I, I love being in a, in a situation that would help children feel that they can conquer the world. your debut solo single over 20 years ago and here you are with 8,000 school children singing it back to you. Does that make you feel proud? Do you know what? It makes me feel quite emotional. Yeah. Very, very emotional and it makes me feel joyful, happy more than anything else because I think to myself, something that you wrote and that was really specifically for myself to remember certain things about life and that these young people have now are now carrying the torch for me with the song and remembering what the word proud means in that very positive sense. And when you think about schools now not getting that funding for creativity, for music, and you have somebody like your Young Voices where they, they send the packs to the schools, the children are just immersed in creativity for a few weeks and then it culminates at something like the AO Arena. It's just the best. I love that there's other things other than just singing, like there's dancing, beatboxing, and I just thought it was very overwhelming. It makes me feel like my true self, and that's really fun. And it's just good because I get to spend time with my friends. So I'm excited, and the atmospheres are very explosive, and the song Proud makes like everybody feel proud. Oh, it really does, doesn't it? I was nearly crying. Were you nearly crying? Not really, but... <laughs> What next for you then, Heather? I will be doing lots of festivals and maybe, you know, maybe even a short cheeky tour at the end of the year. Who oh, knows? A Who knows? Tour. It's, giving, it's giving me it's giving me the bug. It's giving me the bug, Heather. I love that. Can I tell you all as well? I nearly knocked Heather over. Yes, me and a security <laughs> guy earlier today. I, I forgive you. I'd have haunted you for the rest of your life. It's so lovely to see you up An on the stage. Pleasure. And hear those young people. <laughs> Well, I was nearly crying, Well, I was going to say, at least Carl was as well. It's Not so moving, though. it's wonderful, <laughs> and that's all happening tonight. So good luck to yeah. every child who's involved in that. You'll have a great time. OK, let's get on to sport now. Manchester United can book a trip to Wembley tonight, Mike. Yes, they can, Lucy. In truth, they are as good as there already. Manchester United can set up a Carabao Cup final against Newcastle United tonight. They're at home to Nottingham Forest. In the second leg of the semi-finals, United firmly in control of the tie, having won the first leg 3-0 last week. So it would be quite a shock if they didn't make it to the Wembley final later this month. United haven't lifted a trophy since winning the Europa League in 2017. We are playing a semi-final and we have... Um... Uh, we have a perfect uh, chance to go to Wembley and to, to bring a trophy in. 
and therefore uh, we have to um, to focus and therefore we have to to gather the energy therefore we have to gather uh, the good uh, game plan well, meanwhile, United did complete some late business on transfer deadline day. Bayern Munich midfielder Marcel Sabitzer moves to Old Trafford on loan for the remainder of the season. Meanwhile, Manchester City women have confirmed the departure of Vicky Losada. She's joined Italian side Roma on a permanent deal. Blackburn Rovers have set up an FA Cup fifth round tie against Premier League Leicester City. The championship side won their fourth round replay at Birmingham City after a goalless 90 minutes. The match went to extra time. Birmingham defender Austin Trusty scoring an own goal to hand Rovers a 1-0 win. To cricket and Lancashire's Joss Butler has scored another international century. He hit 131 for England this afternoon in the third and final one-day international against South Africa in Kimberley. England, who were trying to avoid a series whitewash, scored 346 for seven in reply. South Africa are 233 for six from 35 overs. Well, next we meet a young man who looks destined to become one of the biggest names in squash. Finlay Withington has just captured the most prestigious title in junior squash, the British Junior Open, becoming the first Lancastrian to win it in nearly half a century. And he isn't finished yet. Chris Hall went along to Finlay's hometown of Bury to see him in action. It's a prize the world's greatest young squash stars have competed for since 1926. To win the British Junior Open has been Finlay Withington's lifelong dream. There's lots of different Opens for different countries, but everyone plays the British Open. It's kind of one of the biggest ones. Everyone that's won kind of under 19s has become a top pro. A guy called Ramia Shaw, he was world number one. Loads of times won world championships, British Opens, seniors. Just wanting to be up there, like with me. Well, I want to be up there with him, sorry. Having won the European Junior Championship and claimed second place at the Junior Worlds, he's now won the oldest and arguably most prestigious junior tournament on the planet. He's been tipped for such greatness since he could first hold a racket. When I first started playing squash, like three around then, on the squash court, yeah. The racket must have been as big as you. <laughs> yeah, there's a few pictures that are, they are as tall as me, yeah. When I was... Quite, quite young, I played men's league, which is like adults playing down at the club. And that helps a lot because they're obviously a lot bigger and stronger. I kind of found ways to win and then it made me stronger playing bigger people. People have like thrown the rackets around the court, like adults and stuff. It's quite funny. I quite like getting under people's skin when I'm playing. They lose their head and it becomes easier match. Josh Taylor has been coaching Finn since he was 10 after spotting his star quality. He's always played in quite a expressive, creative kind of way. He's always had quite a lot of skill. So Finn's ranked, uh, he's got up to like top 130 in the world now. So the next spell is all about really doing well on the Challenger Tour. Once you get to top 46 in the world, you're guaranteed to get into the World Tour events, which is the next tier of events. Finn is the first Lancastrian to win the British Junior Open since Phil Kenyon in 1975, who was England's number one player within seven years. The addition of squash to the Commonwealth Games came too late for Phil, but is now a major target for his successor. It's definitely a goal of mine to play in that. Um, I went to watch it last year, the final. It's just the crowd was really good. Just want to play in front of loads of people. Yeah, by the end of the year, hopefully being top 100, like beating players inside the top 70 and stuff like that. Having turned professional, he'll switch his focus to senior level, once again testing the temperament of his older opponents. Chris Hall, ITV News, Bury. Yeah, you can tell Finn is a real competitor when he says he likes to get under the skin yeah. of his opponents. <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks for that, Mike. Mm -hmm. uh, it's hard to keep up with it. It moves so quickly. <laughs> uh, OK, well, the excitement is really <laughs> building about a new comet heading this way. As it's green, it's now affectionately known in our newsroom as Kermit the Comet. Well, to be fair, you are the only person in the newsroom that called it Kermit the Comet. The rest of us called it the Green Comet. It's okay. not easy being green. Yeah, OK, well, you've landed me completely now. I was just trying to avoid using its other catchy little title, C forward slash 2022 E3 bracket ZTF. Are you swearing at me? Uh, well, here it is, and it's making the cl its closest pass to the Earth tonight. So will the weather allow us to see it? 
Well, there is no better place to watch out mm -hmm. for this than the wonderful Jodrell Bank in Cheshire. And it's there that we join the wonderful Joe. <laughs> the very windswept Joe this evening, Lucy. Thank you very much. Yes, the latest comet to be discovered by astronomers last March is appearing in the skies above the Northern Hemisphere at the moment. It has been for the last few weeks. In fact, a few eagle-eyed viewers have already spotted it this weekend. Of course, it's been giving off a rather greenish hue as well. The very catchly named C2022 E3ZTF has been spotted already and it'll be with us for the next week or so. Now, here at Judgerall Bank, the Lovell telescope behind me is much much more concerned about spotting pulsars or the remains of exploded stars in faraway galaxies. But tonight's comet is much closer to Earth. Joining me now, Dr Anthony Holloway from the observatory. Dr Anthony, where does this comet come from? So it's one of the most distant comets. Um, this has come from a region way out 50 times further away than Pluto, right in the outer regions of the solar system, and then has travelled in come close to the sun, come close to the earth, and he's now headed back out again. It's like a boomerang effect, yeah. isn't it? And what's the greenish hue about? So this is where the sun heats up the comet and all the gases come off. And those gases then, when the sun lights up, they give off this greenish hue. And what are our chances of seeing it tonight? Where do we need to look? So we're looking in the north. Tonight at the minute, it's sort of fairly close to the pole star. Um, it's not got quite as bright as people were hoping. It's always a bit of a game trying to predict how bright he's going to get. Um, so it's best to use a pair of binoculars if you've got them. That'll give you a, a better chance of seeing it uh, and as dark a sky as possible. Uh, we've got the moon around at the moment. That's going to be going away in the next few days, so we'll be a uh, better chance of seeing it then. This is a very rare event, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, these sort of comets, I mean, it have been travelling for thousands of years to get into the inner solar system. Um, but we get these comets maybe every 80 months, two years. There's a chance of seeing one with binoculars. Um, very occasionally we get the ones that are really bright with the naked eye and we see the massive trails across the sky. But we're, fingers crossed, every time one's discovered, we hope. Keep the binoculars handy. Thank <laughs> you very much, Anthony. Will the weather be kind? Let's take a look. Why do I need a shower? I've been out in the rain. The faster you go, the sooner you'll be out. You'll save water too. United Utilities sponsors ITV Granada Weather. And it's been a windy day here in the northwest. At Judgeville Bank this evening, that wind is rattling round, and that continues to be the theme over the next few days. Rather cloudy skies, windy, spells of rain. On the whole, quite mild. We're free from frost, and temperatures by day are quite a few degrees above average for the time of year. It will all change, though, as we get towards the end of this week and into next. A little shift in the jet stream will allow some slightly colder air to dig in as we head through into next week. A return to more wintry conditions with some frostiness around and cold days as well. Back to the details for this evening. And for many parts of the north and west, there's a few showers around before midnight and then it quietens down. Very breezy conditions continuing. For most places, a largely dry but quite cloudy night. Free from frost, five or six Celsius in sheltered parts of the Lake District perhaps. But into the early hours of tomorrow morning, we are going to see a spell of heavy rain move in to the Lakeland Fells and the Pennines. On to tomorrow. And those are the sun times. It'll be setting tomorrow evening at 4.54. Now for tomorrow, a bit of a cloudy start in places, some hill fog on trans-pennine routes and patchy rain to begin with, but on the whole, a largely dry day. Quite cloudy skies, but we could just see a few breaks developing into the afternoon. And temperature-wise, it's mild, maybe getting to around 11 Celsius during tomorrow afternoon, but another windy day, especially for exposed western coasts. Looking ahead into the rest of the week, well, certainly by Sunday, it's turning quite chilly. United Utilities sponsors ITV Granada Weather. Yeah, Joe there from the Jodrell Bank. Uh, just before we go, yeah, it's awesome. Um, before we go, we've been laughing all day at the blue plaque that's uh, appeared in Lancashire, commemorating the spot where Prime Minister Rishi Sunak was filmed not wearing a seatbelt. Well, that's not a laughing matter, of course, but the plaque has raised a smile or two on Squires Gate Lane near Blackpool Airport. There's a reminder of the story that led to that blue yeah. plaque. They should have red ones as well, I suppose, in the interests of balance. Yeah, let's anyway, not get ourselves it. in trouble, Lucy. Yeah, if you're driving, belt up. Bye-bye. Good night. <laughs>